there's uh, several thousand stars that you can pick out in the nighttime sky on any clear night. Uh, from a city it's not so great, uh, but from a dark location it's pretty spectacular. Uh, we've sort of lost a sense of what the sky looks like and uh, the sense of wonderment that there, there has been in ancient times looking up at the sky. Uh, ancient peoples were much more connected with the stars. From what we can tell in uh, human history, the stars have played an important role in uh, civilization. So as humans have gone from being hunter-gatherers to being uh, civilized, to being living in communities, uh, they have needed to understand the passing of the seasons. So if you're going to start planting crops, uh, you need to be aware of, of when the springtime is, when the summertime is, when winter's coming, and things like that. And the ancient peoples have found uh, the constellations to be a, a very, very useful tool in that respect. So if you look up into the sky, uh, you can see patterns of stars. and We're very, very good at recognizing patterns, although I have to admit that that some of the patterns that you see and the names associated with them, some look more convincing than others. So on the top right hand side here, uh, you can see two recognizable constellations of the summer sky. Uh, can you recognize those two constellations? Uh, the one to the left is the constellation of Sagittarius. Sagittarius is an archer, uh, although I have to say it, it looks a bit more like a teapot than an archer. If you draw in the main stars, there's the handle of the teapot, there's the lid of the teapot, and there's the spout. Looks definitely looks like a teapot shape in the sky. And then beside it is the other recognized constellation of the summer sky called Scorpius the scorpion. It definitely looks like what it's supposed to look like. If you can got the, the curve in the teal and in the stinger as well. Uh, those are well recognized constellations in the uh, low down in the, in the summer sky. And so what uh, ancient peoples have done is they've seen patterns in the sky and then they've made uh, stories associated with those patterns. And you could pass those stories down uh, through generations. And so by remembering the stories, you can actually remember what kind of season it is. So when you see Sagittarius and Scorpius in the sky, you, you definitely know that, it, that it's summertime. Uh, underneath, uh, you've got the most recognisable constellation of uh, Leo, the lion, which is uh, a constellation of the springtime. So when you see Leo up in the sky, then you know it's definitely spring. Uh, in amongst the fixed stars, uh, the ancient peoples noticed uh, objects which appear to move against the background stars. These objects were originally called planets. Uh, and really all a planet meant was it meant a, it was a wandering star, an object of pe which appeared to, to move against the background objects. Now in ancient times what they called a planet and what we call a planet today is, is quite different. Uh, they would have classified the, the sun and the moon as planets uh, and they wouldn't have classified the earth as a planet. Uh, so the sun and the moon and then the five recognizable planets you can see in the nighttime sky. So that would be uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Okay, so that makes up seven objects, uh, and all of those seven objects were worshipped as gods. In fact, that's the only reason why we have seven days to the week. Uh, each day of the week is named after these uh, seven objects that appear to move against the, the stars. Uh, it's easy to work out the sun, obviously that's Sunday, and then the moon would be Monday. Uh, Tuesday is named after Mars. Wednesday is named after Mercury. Thursday is named after Jupiter. Friday is named after Venus. Uh, and obviously Saturday is named after Saturn. Okay. 
So you can recognize different patterns of stars in the sky uh, depending upon uh, the seasons. Uh, some of the planets move fast and some of them move quite slowly. Here in this diagram at the bottom is showing the motion of Mars. Now Mars takes about 30 years uh, to go around uh, the sky. So if you take into account the constellations of the zodiac, this is the, the band of constellations that the Sun uh, and the planets appear to go through, uh, Saturn spends approximately two and a half years in every single constellation of the zodiac. Here's a diagram showing you the motion of Saturn through the constellation of Leo over the course of a three year period. Okay, so what we're going to do, look at is we're going to look at the motion of these uh, objects in the uh, nighttime sky from the perspective of the Earth. Okay, now the patterns themselves uh, have been recognized uh, in ancient times to represent different animals like uh, a lion or a large bear or mythological uh, heroes like uh, Perseus or Hercules or something along those lines. Uh, and they've usually used these to uh, break up the patterns of the in the sky to, to help them remember the different constellations. So, for instance, uh, here is a, a sky for the fall or autumn time of the year. Uh, and if you uh, look at it, uh, you can recognize uh, different creatures. So, so here is a, uh, let's see now, we've got a, we've got a winged horse. So here are the uh, typical stars that you can see uh, in the fall time. And if I start picking out the names of the constellations, uh, you might see how ancient people have, have used stories to, to remember them. So here you can see a winged horse called Pegasus. Uh, beside Pegasus, you've got a maiden called Andromeda. Above Andromeda, you've got the constellations of Cassiopeia and Cepheus uh, and then to the uh, left of uh, Andromeda you have the constellation of Perseus okay now in the actual mythological story you may have, you may have uh, read the book or you may have uh, watched the movie associated with it. Uh, Cassiopeia and Cepheus are the king and queen of uh, Ethiopia and Cassiopeia claimed that her daughter Andromeda was the most beautiful creature on the planet and because of that the gods sent the Kraken to destroy the country. And so the mother and father decided that the best thing to do was to tie the daughter Andromeda uh, to rocks and sacrifice her to the Kraken. Uh, Perseus the hero had other ideas uh, he decided that the best way to get rid of the Kraken was to uh, fight the Gorgon Medusa. Uh, there's actually a, a variable star in the constellation of Perseus uh, called Algol which represents the head of the Gorgon and uh, he chopped the Gorgon's head off and supposedly blood fell out of the out of the head into the ground. Up comes a winged horse called Pegasus Perseus jumps on the winged horse, flies over to the ocean, produces the gorgon's head, the kraken turns to stone, and everybody's saved. So you can actually see that whole story in the fall time sky. So these constellations, the, the patterns that you see, uh, are supposed to represent these uh, mythological stories. The oldest constellations that we have records for date back around 5,000 years. And these stories have been passed down from generation to generation, allowing people to remember the different, kind, different times of the year. 
Okay, today now we've made this much more scientific. Uh, the International Astronomical Union, or IAU, uh, define what the constellations are today. And so what they've done is, rather than simply taking the patterns of the stars as the constellations, so in ancient times you have a massive square of stars called the Great Square of Pegasus. Uh, in modern times, Pegasus is actually an area of the sky, just a bit like the, the way the United States are. Uh, there are states attached together and there's no space between them. So today the, the, uh, the constellations are areas in the sky which may or may not contain the actual original ancient stars. For instance, if you look at the uh, star Alpharats, it's part of the great square of Pegasus, but it's actually the Alpha star in the constellation of Andromeda. So in ancient times, uh, it was uh, part of this uh, pattern called Pegasus, but now it's actually the first star in Andromeda. Now, what the IAU define as constellations, those are the official patterns of stars in the sky. So Ursa Major, the Great Bear, Ursa Minor, the Small Bear, Leo the Lion, Orion the Hunter, those are all official constellations. There are other patterns in the sky as well, and these are called asterisms. An asterism is a pattern of stars which may be smaller or bigger than a constellation. It's just a, an unofficial uh, designation of stars in the sky. So the great square of Pegasus is actually an asterism. Uh, other common asterisms are the Big Dipper, which is part of the constellation of Ursa Major, uh, the Sickle, which is part of the constellation of Leo the Lion, uh, the Summer Triangle is another famous uh, asterism which actually contains three separate constellations. Today the IAU recognize 88 individual constellations of the nighttime sky. Uh, in the original star maps, there were originally 48 constellations. Now we recognize 88 of them. Some of them are ancient, going back a very, very long time. Some of them are quite modern, like for instance the constellation of Fornax is definitely not an ancient constellation. It is referring to a Lab Vernus, which is a product of modern science. Uh, in amongst those 88 constellations, uh, there are 13 constellations where the planets appear to move through. Now, originally there were 12 constellations. They're called the Zodiac. Uh, the Zodiac is the band of animals. It is the region of the sky that the sun appears to go through and the rest of the planets as well. There's a 13th constellation called Ophiuchus and we'll uh, talk about that uh, when we look at uh, a map of the whole sky. But there you have it, that's the, the different constellations that you can see uh, throughout the seasons that were recognized in ancient times.